Hello, and welcome to Contagious Conversations. I'm your host, Claire Stinson. Every episode, we'll hear from inspiring leaders and innovators who make the world healthier and safer for us all. Contagious Conversations is brought to you by the CDC Foundation, an independent nonprofit that builds partnerships to help the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention save and improve more lives. Joining me today is Marin McKenna, an independent journalist who specializes in public health, global health, and food policy. Marin is a columnist for Wired, a senior fellow at Emory Center for the Study of Human Health, and the author of the 2017 bestseller Big Chicken, as well as the award-winning books Superbug and Beating Back the Devil. In this episode, Marin shares her unique career journey, describes why storytelling matters, and tells us what it's like to be on the front lines of public health responses. Welcome, Marin. Thanks for having me. We're so excited you're here today. So for starters, Marin, how did you decide to become a journalist? I was an unsuccessful dramaturg. Seriously. (laughs) So I have an undergraduate degree in 16th century theater and 20th century poetry, um, which was mostly Shakespeare and Eliot. And I thought I was going to be an English professor. This is the point at which everyone who's acquainted with me as a public health person starts to feel their eyebrows climb up their foreheads. I thought I was going to be uh, the owner of a theater company and I would work in theater. And it took a couple of years out of being undergrad to realize that that was not actually going to be sustainable. So I thought I'd I'd revert to being a writer. Where I was living at the time in Washington, D.C. was a highly competitive writing environment, as it is now. And it seemed to make sense that if I went and got some kind of writing degree, I would be a more competitive freelancer. So I went off to journalism school, and I wasn't expecting to actually fall in love with journalism. But I exited journalism school not as a writer about the arts headed back to Washington, D.C., but as a journalist trained in investigative reporting and heading to my first newspaper job. Fascinating. That's not an answer you get from many that you ask about your journalism path. So would you say you were drawn to public health pretty immediately when you went to journalism school? So at the time, it felt completely random and accidental, though when I look back, it actually all makes sense. So as I said, I got out of journalism school with a kind of a specialty in investigative reporting. And my first job in upstate Illinois actually didn't have anything to do with public health. I was tasked with helping figure out why savings and loans in the town where I lived were going broke unexpectedly, and that involved a lot of document-based digging into profit and loss statements. As always happens in newspapers, or at least as used to happen, when you do a particular kind of story well, your reward is to do another one of that kind of story. And so the next sets of stories I were asked to do, the next investigations, all turned out to hinge on epidemiology. One was a cancer cluster close to a closed nuclear weapons plant that dated back to the Manhattan Project. Another was the first signals of illness among reservists returning from the first Gulf War, which turned out to be the first cases of Gulf War syndrome. And then there were others involving emergency medical funding and communications and so forth. All of those turned out to be public health stories. But I didn't actually go to them, at least at start, because they were public health stories, but rather because they were investigations that could use my skills. And then at a certain point, I turned around and thought, oh, I've become a public health reporter. That was not actually part of the plan. That's amazing. So did you fall in love with investigative journalism pretty quickly? I did, absolutely. Uh, There was something about being able to dig very deeply into a story and understand the nuances. Now, the, the trick in journalism then and now is... To internalize enough of the nuances that you can sum them up for your readers, because if you spend six months or a year and thousands and thousands of pages digging into something, your audience is not going to have an appetite for all of that. So understanding how to translate uh, and sum up things in a manner that made sense to people who know nothing about the topic turned out to be a really key skill, and it's probably the thing that I'm most have carried with me from my earliest days as an investigative reporter to the kind of work that I do now. That's amazing. So you are a really, truly talented storyteller. How would you say 
your storytelling talent came about. Did you know immediately that you needed to become a storyteller through investigative journalism? So this is the part of journalism that I think makes public health people nuts, <laughs> is that the strongest stories are essentially N of one. They, they find a single thread of narrative, whether it's the story of one person or the story of one group, and, and use that as the spine for an explanation of a problem, a phenomenon, a thing that has to be addressed. I think we all actually understand that intuitively um, from children. You know, when our, when our parents or whoever is taking care of us or our, our preschool teachers read us a story, the, the story is about a character or a small group of characters. If you think of something like Lord of the Rings, for instance, you know, there are archetypes of story that we naturally gravitate to. I think one of the, both one of the, pleasures and also one of the challenges of public health storytelling is finding those perfect narratives that are not only moving personal or small group stories, but also serve to illuminate whatever that larger question is that you're trying to tackle. Building on that, based on your experience, what role do you think journalists play in increasing awareness about public health? I think it's really critical, partly because journalists are storytellers. And, you know, because public health is, uh, is a discipline of populations and groups, the point of intersection between public health scientists and practitioners and journalists telling stories about public health is finding that moment or that spot where the, the big data sets or the, exper the big experiences of populations can be translated into a narrative that makes sense for the mass audience. That's the journalist's challenge and job and joy if it goes well is is finding that exact right story or set of stories that are rich enough and accurate enough and complex enough that they can make these complicated encounters with data real for the mass audience in a way that doesn't require them to know, you know, some complicated software program somewhere. Exactly. And what you were talking about earlier resonates with me, you know, storytelling resonates. Stories resonate with people, maybe more so than some data and some statistics. And I think that you're really, truly talented at that. So I appreciate that about what you do in your writing. You've covered emergencies from a tsunami to Hurricane Katrina to all different kinds of outbreaks. Um, what did you learn about the difficulty in conducting basic health activities following crises like these? In 2005, I, I had a particularly kind of keyhole close-up view of this, um, because in the same year I went to the Indian Ocean tsunami and also to Hurricane Katrina. I think the thing that people who don't have any reason to be up close with epidemics and disasters don't understand is how messy and chaotic things are on the ground. And also how much of what goes on on the ground is something that looks from the outside really boring, right? It's, the, it's figuring out the logistics. It's finding drivers. It's figuring out if the roads are open. It's trying to sort out how if the cell networks are down, you're going to communicate with people who are 50 miles up the road from you. I think you really have to be in that situation to appreciate how much upfront work there is before you can actually get to the tasks that people would think of as public health tasks. Here's one example. In the early 2000s, I embedded with a polio eradication team in Uttar Pradesh. Uh, I was there for, I think I was there for a couple of weeks, and I was going to accompany the members of that team, especially those two leaders, as they tried to figure out how immunization was being conducted in a particular, essentially slum area in a very poor village in a, a village that had a lot of kind of vaccine hesitancy and resistance. It turned out that there were no maps for the slum. So there was no way to know where the households were. Now, this was more than 10 years ago. The mapping has proceeded at a very rapid pace now. So this might not be a situation that would exist today in the same way that it did your, these, you know, more than a decade ago. But I have this vivid memory of sitting with this female German physician with the leaders of this village, all older men, not particularly interested in <laughs> encountering a woman in a position of influence, if not power, 
as she stared at these giant handwritten maps of the slum, the Jugi, and saying to them, this is not going to work, this is not adequate, we need to know where every, every family is. And no one had ever needed to put that down on paper before in the village because everyone had a sort of intuitive sense of where people were. It would never have occurred to me that one of the challenges, one of the logistical challenges before you could do a big public health activity like an immunization campaign would be that you literally had to draw a map of where you're going because the map didn't exist. So that's a good segue into my next question. (laughs) You have covered antibiotics and antibiotic resistance extensively in your career. What has drawn you to this topic in particular? My first encounter with the problem of antibiotic resistance uh, actually is because of the CDC's disease detectives. Uh, In 2002 and 2003, I had wangled an agreement to uh, embed, as we say now, with the 2002 incoming class of the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Um, This is an experience that is the basis of my first book, Beating Back the Devil, which is a history of the EIS. So I went through their initial training with them in the summer. I identified some people in the class who I thought were were particularly interesting or who were least resistant to having a journalist hang out with them, which was by no means a guaranteed thing. And I just kept in touch with them over the year and and would visit them periodically when some interesting things were going on. So one of them, Dr. Nolan Lee, had been sent to Los Angeles where he was in the infectious disease division of the public health department. And he ended up involved in this really interesting outbreak of drug resistant staff, MRSA. Um, the, the particular thing about this, so this is 2003. So it's a little bit before the, the crest of the epidemic of community associated MRSA in the United States. He stumbled across, uh, thanks to some reports from some alert clinicians, a group of men in Los Angeles who had very serious skin and soft tissue infections from drug-resistant staff that were requ- requiring surgical help and were putting them in the hospital. Um, that were really a, a, a really very unpleasant outbreak. These men all were gay. They all particip- They all went to sex clubs, and so this was a, a an investigation that was politically fragile and touchy. Because if it had gone badly, it had the the potential to ignite a sex panic that might have been similar to the sex panics around um, sex clubs in the early days of HIV. Fortunately, thanks to this perspicacious uh, disease detective, um, he figured out that the problem was benches. Benches in this in the sex clubs that were no different than benches in any gym. They were basically just benches that people sat on, that the organism from their skin was persisting on, um, and it was just able to survive for a while, and they hadn't been disinfected well. An outbreak that was relatively uncomplicated, or at least it looked that way once it was solved, and yet could have had such profound social and political impact if it went badly, gave me a kind of pathway to follow into the whole problem of MRSA. How it started out as a hospital organism, became a community organism, became a livestock organism, and how at no point in that story did we look far enough ahead to anticipate what was coming next. That was so interesting and complicated, and in a way really encapsulates the entire international epidemic of antibiotic resistance from the earliest days of the antibiotic era up until today that it was a story big enough that only a book could contain it. And so that led to my second book, Superbug, which is essentially the biography of MRSA. And in the experience of reporting that, I stumbled across some statistics about how we use antibiotics in livestock compared to how we use them in medicine, that again was a story so big that it needed a book to tell it properly. And that's this book that came out in 2017, Big Chicken, which is the the history of how we came to give antibiotics to most of the meat animals on the planet and how we discovered that was a terrible idea. So let's talk chicken, shall we? Why chickens? It was a surprise to me to discover that the story of chicken in a way really brackets the story of antibiotic discovery and antibiotic misuse. 
for anyone who hears this, uh, who has any relation to Georgia or to Atlanta, they will hear the title Big Chicken and want to know if it's about the Big Chicken in Marietta. Of course. And the answer is no. <laughs> it is the, the Big Chicken, uh, for people who are not familiar with Georgia, is uh, a Kentucky Fried Chicken outpost that dates from, I think, the 1950s or 60s that is, in fact, uh, a multi-story tall chicken. People use it as a landmark. They say, you know, you drive down to the Big Chicken and turn left. Um, KFC actually is not a part of the book, really. Um, they were kind of late to uh, doing better on antibiotics, and so I didn't tell their story. The chickens were the first animals to get experimentally the tiny doses of antibiotics that we came to call growth promoters, which were given to most livestock in most countries up until very recently. That means that chicken essentially prefigured the industrialization of livestock agriculture that occurs at the beginning of the antibiotic era, which is also at the end of World War II. Chicken effectively teaches the, the producers of other species, cattle and hogs, how to misuse antibiotics in a way that leans into industrialization and intensification. And then here in the United States, Chicken turns out to be the sector of the protein economy that just in the past couple of years has turned away from routine antibiotic use and turned away not really so much because of government regulation, though that has occurred, but because really of consumer pressure, because market tastes have changed and buyers have convinced poultry companies at least to move away from routine antibiotic use. So chicken is sort of teaching the rest of livestock agriculture how to reverse that historic mistake that it led livestock agriculture into decades ago. So in your book, at the beginning, you talk about being on the streets of Paris and having some roast chicken from, I believe, a street vendor. True. That changed your life. It was delicious. Can you talk a little bit more about that? <laughs> sure. So um, for anyone who's ever been to, to France, this is a very normal thing. I mean, the, the part of the reason why I wanted to tell the story was not just my personal sensory experience of this amazing chicken, but also to try to describe or hint at how common it is in the rest of the world for chicken to be delicious. You know, when we say in the United States, tastes like chicken, what we're really saying is that it doesn't taste like anything much at all, right? It, but but in, in most parts of the world, chicken actually tastes like something. I mean, it tastes like itself, but it doesn't taste like nothing. So um, I went to Paris, and I just happened to go to one of the street markets where Parisians very routinely buy their food. Not, you know, it's not kind of a tourist thing. It's a thing where you go a couple of times a week, and you meet the most recent, the producers who brought things in, the most recent uh, produce. And there's always one or two vendors that have these vertical cabinets that look sort of like freestanding wardrobes or closets. They're metal, they're on wheels, they plug into a, a generator or street power, and they have in them racks and racks and racks of chickens that have been split down the back. The cooking term for that is spatchcocked, but the French for it is crapaudine, which uh, indicates that when you flatten the chicken, it looks like the outline of a frog. And they turn on these racks for hours. And when you buy one, they, they open up the cabinet, they slide the chicken off the rack, they put it into a bag that's foil lined, um, but not super tightly closed up. And then you scurry home with it and usually you eat it for Sunday lunch. And it is so delicious because first, the chickens taste like something. And second, they're very herby. And third, the skin is very crisp. And fourth, of course, it's Paris. So that probably enhances the whole experience. Of course. So I had just kind of randomly walked past one of these and thought, oh, that looks tasty. I have to have one of those. And I, I bought one and I took it down the street to my apartment and I bit into it and it, my head exploded and it changed my life. <laughs> so it really does sound like it changed your life. We'll be right back with Marin McKenna. Since this is a show about contagious conversations, we want to hear from you. Each episode will ask you a question, and this episode's question is simple. Have you ever had chicken, or any food, in another country that changed your life? Just go to cdcfoundation.org slash conversations and click on the email icon to answer. That's cdcfoundation.org slash conversations. And if you share your thoughts with us, you'll have the chance to win a signed copy of Marin's book, Big Chicken. And now, back to our conversation with Marin. So 
a follow-up question that I think many of our listeners may have. Do you still eat chicken? I do. In fact, so, so the scene we're talking about is the first scene in the book. But the last scene in the book is me also stuffing my face with chicken at a restaurant in Brooklyn that serves a bird that comes from a small farm in upstate New York, a, a very similar chicken to my French market chicken. But the underlying point of all of this for me was that I, I have thought about this very, in, very carefully through my life, and I have concluded that I am, in fact, a meat eater. Um, and being a meat eater... I feel like I am entitled to ask questions about how the meat I eat is raised and to advocate, if I can, for it being raised better. I don't think the only appropriate response to asking questions about meat eating is to turn away from livestock agriculture altogether and to no to longer eat meat. Um, I think those of us who still want to eat meat are equally entitled to ask those questions. And so this book is sort of my book length exploration of those questions and the answers I came up with and, and where I think meat agriculture made mistakes and where it's been pushed to be better and where in the end it can go. That's quite an evolution. So for our listeners that want to read this book, it is titled Big Chicken by Marin McKenna, uh, 2017. Correct. I believe published by Nat Geo Books. Right. National Geographic, Penguin Random House. It will be out in paperback in the summer of 2019. Oh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. So going back to your investigative journalism, you wrote a piece in Wired this past December about Disease X. It has a cryptic and scary sound to it. Could you tell us a little bit about that? It does have a cryptic and scary sound, and I want to just make it clear that I am not responsible for that. <laughs> Disease X is actually a, a concept that was put out by the World Health Organization. When in uh, twenty, the beginning of 2018, they were trying to set sort of priorities for what nations and, and public health infrastructures should be aware of in terms of threats coming toward them. Disease X is not a particular disease. Disease X is really a concept and behind that concept is the, the sense that we don't know what's coming next, that, that whatever the, the next big thing is or some big future thing, it is going to surprise us in some fundamental way. Whether it's a known disease that has new symptoms in a new place, like West Nile virus in the 2000s, or a disease that is quiescent in one area and explodes in another, like Zika just in the past couple of years, or a completely new disease that we've never seen before. We have to have the sensitivity and the, the structures, surveillance and the infrastructure, to be able to counter a threat of any type regardless of what that threat turns out to be. That, that, that is my interpretation of what lies behind the disease X concept. In the column that you're talking about, I was making the point that we have one of these diseases going on in the United States right now, which is the, the, the episodic sort of epidemic, these, these randomly distributed cases of acute flaccid myelitis occurring in children, paralytic um, syndromes occurring in children, and that we have not yet, we, the public health infrastructure, has not yet been able to identify one single causative factor for this. And this is an example contained to the United States and to, you know, a couple of hundred, less than a thousand cases so far of what we might be dealing with, with a new disease, that we see the symptoms, we see the cases before we can identify the pathways by which it's come to us, the causative factors, the things that are making it more or less likely to occur, the host factors that make one person more vulnerable to it than another. And so I was not in particular launching a criticism of how public health has responded to AFM, acute flaccid myelitis, as much as using AFM as a, a sort of window to look at what the challenges are going to be when we potentially have a much larger epidemic, which everyone assumes we will have of something at some point, someday. So that is a perfect segue into my next question. I was actually just about to ask you, you it sounds like pretty much you are a disease detective. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Mary McKenna <laughs> is a disease detective. Thank you so much. What concerns you on the horizon for public health? What do you think we as Americans need to be concerned about in terms of the next big outbreak or epidemic? You know... 
<laughs> there are so many things to be concerned about. Um, and each of them sort of have, are most prominent in a different realm. I think overall, the monster that lurks at the back of the mind of anyone who is, has any acquaintance with public health is some international pandemic. And the one that we all think about is influenza. Because, you know, we are now, we are at the 101st year anniversary of the influenza of 1918, the largest known pandemic in history, possibly 100 million dead. Flu is a very unpredictable virus. We have moderately good surveillance for it, but it still moves much faster than most of our surveillance can report. And we have really profound challenges in getting countermeasures to it, getting vaccines out fast enough. And some of those problems are scientific problems, but many more of them are problems of the infrastructure of how we have consigned vaccine manufacture to the private sector and have asked the private sector to produce things that are not particularly lucrative for them to do. And as companies answering to shareholders into a market, they have good reasons not to do the things that public health would ideally like them to do. That mismatch between what public health needs and what the market can deliver is a thing that I think we are going to have to solve in some manner. Because it's also true for antibiotic resistance, you know, that we have in the world very few companies now making antibiotics because they have decided with very defensible logic that making antibiotics is not in their financial interest. You know, antibiotics take as long to make as any other new compound, but you take them for a much shorter period of time. So making back your R&D, if you are a company, is very, very challenging. And while you are making back that R&D or some portion of it, the bugs are gaining on your drug. So the market structure that delivers antibiotics is not adequate to countering antibiotic resistance, to getting new drugs out in front of resistance mutations in the same way that, or in a parallel way to the structure of making vaccines not being adequate to the advance of a novel virus. So Marin, here at the CDC Foundation, we are focused on public-private partnerships. So I have to ask you, what role do public-private partnerships have in public health? I think they're very important. And let me answer out of the, the antibiotics world, which is the one that I know best at this point. An excellent example of a public-private partnership that's really accomplishing something is the organization CARB-X, which is an accelerator for very early stage research into antibiotics that combines public funding from several governments and private funding from several large philanthropic organizations. The pool of money that that created is allowing that organization, which has a vast and very expert scientific advisory board, has very rigorous examination of projects to pick researchers and organizations that are researching new antibiotic compounds and crucially needed things for antibiotic resistance, such as new diagnostics, and giving them enough money to get through their very, very early stage research, such that when they get into the clinical trial part, that they will be able to move on from there on their own. You know, this is a response in part to the backing away of the, the traditional very big pharma companies, the legacy pharma companies, from antibiotics research. They, there might previously have been a small biotech working on something, trusting that when they got to a particular point, they would be snapped up by the big fish, but the big fish have swum away somewhere else. So this organization is now using this public-private money as leverage to get these these very small biotechs over the gap to the point at which they're viable. And there really are no other sources of funds to do that. Something like that might help us have another generation of antibiotics at a point when they're crucially needed. And so, so we already know, as we talked about, that um, federal money by itself is not enough uh, because federal money is diminishing for reasons that exist outside of the public health sphere. And therefore, it's the combination of federal money and the extra boost from pi private philanthropy that might actually get us over the gap to having new antibiotics when we need them. Thank you for saying that so eloquently. And thank you for sharing all of your stories today. This is really fascinating. So I have one more question for you. So as an experienced journalist, what advice do you have for young people today who want to pursue journalism? Oh, this is a complicated question. 
<laughs> partly because, of course, as someone who's sort of in the uh, at, as much of a peak of my career as I'm going to get, I think I, I I'm supposed to say, oh, I want a younger generation to follow along behind me. But there is no denying that journalism is a difficult profession now. In some ways, I think more difficult than it's ever been because the bottom of the pyramid, the the small news organizations that acquainted people at a local level with all of the issues wherever they lived, whether that was outbreaks or the funding of their public health department or the funding of their school system or whether their police chief was on the take, those are vanishing. And so people no longer live in a context of local news. That makes it harder for them to understand why it is they should be invested in national news. And of course, they're never before, at least not you know, not in the 20th century or the 20, up till now in the 21st, has there been this atmosphere of distrust of news so profound that we're being told that we are not real, that we're fake news. You might be able to find that back in the 19th century, but that was not part of the 20th century compact that built the news media that I know today. So on the one hand, it's hard for me to say to someone who's trying to figure out their path in the world yeah, you should come into this profession because this profession is fragile right now. But precisely for that reason, I think this profession is needed more than ever. The one thing I would say to people who have an affection for public health, but also are interested in the watchdog and oversight and storytelling um, potential of journalism, is that I think journalism is more open than it ever has been to people coming in from other career paths. You know, that my career path shows that people who were, were becoming journalists in the 80s and 90s, you were supposed to train as a journalist. And after that, you were supposed to learn your topic on the job or to go off and do some extra schooling on your own that taught you to be a politics reporter, a public health reporter, a sports reporter, anything like that. Maybe you didn't have to learn to be a sports reporter. Maybe people just kind of grew up knowing that. Now I think it's much more common that people actually pursue a scientific career or a public health career, or at least the schooling for that. You know, go through an MPH, go through a PhD. In some cases, go through an MD and residency, and then decide, no, they feel better suited for communicating science and public health than for practicing it as a clinician or as a researcher. I think that journalism is much more open to people making a lateral move like that. And I think it enriches journalism that people come in with subject matter expertise that they previously had to gain on the job. So summing up, I would say I certainly hope that people continue to come into journalism. And in some ways, I feel like the, the doors of journalism are wider to people with other interests than they ever have been. We just hope that the funding follows them. That's good advice. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. To explore bonus content from today's episode, including a photo of Marin on a poultry farm, links to her award-winning books, and her TED Talk, which has been viewed over 1.6 million times, go to cdcfoundation.org slash conversations. Thanks for listening to Contagious Conversations, produced by the CDC Foundation and available wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to visit cdcfoundation.org slash conversations for show notes and bonus content. And if you like what you just heard, please pass it along to your colleagues and friends, rate the show, leave a review, and tell others. It helps us get the word out. Thanks again for tuning in and join us next time for another episode of Contagious Conversations. Contagious Conversations.